Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford, and in this video I'd like to talk to you about Norse beliefs in afterlives and afterworlds. People today like to talk about Christian influence on the Norse myths that survive, but I think one of the best examples of Christian influence on our perception of Norse myths today does not have to do with any particular myth that's preserved or any detail about it, but rather in the way that people systematically want the afterlife to work. There's a common, very popular portrayal of two, maybe three alternatives, where the majority of the dead go to hell, those who die in battle go to Valhalla or to Folkvang, and uh, that's pretty cleanly it. But in fact, our Norse sources are much more complex than that and probably reflect several different layers of belief, uh, some very early, some very late, and probably reflect generational differences as well as regional differences. Now one thing I ought to point out as we get into this is that two words in particular that I will be using quite a bit in this video are perhaps not the way that you would normally hear them, aside from the fact that I use reconstructed Old Norse pronunciation rather than modern Icelandic pronunciation, which is true of all my videos. I will often be mentioning hell and Valhul. Now, in many modern websites and books, these are written hella and Valhalla, but in fact these A's are not part of these words in Old Norse. The A's are added in 18th and 19th century works by writers who want to make these Norse words look more classical. These words are feminine in gender, and in Greek or Latin, uh, many feminine words in an A, as many feminine words do in Old Norse, such as Freya, or words like kona, woman, or saga even. But these words don't end with an A in Old Norse, so I'm going to say hell and valhul, not hella, not valhalla. And the same thing is true of frig. She is not friga in Old Norse. All right. Having established that, there is really no single canon set of afterlives, right? There is, there is Snorri's portrayal in his prose Edda, but as much as people talk about, uh, as, 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 as much as the, the, the fans of Norse mythology talk about how much Snorri is influenced by Christianity, they often fail to understand just how much his systematic portrayal of the afterlife is influenced by Christianity. Now, if we really dig deep, it goes, it gets a lot more interesting than just hell versus Valhul. First of all, if we look at the archeological evidence and at burial practices, there clearly was at some early date, a strong association of the sea and ships with the afterlife. We see memorials or graves that are shaped like ships, such as Alestenar, Ale stones in uh, far Southern Sweden, which is from about 550 AD, uh, and many others. Uh, sometimes they're not just shaped like ships, sometimes they, the dead are actually buried in ships, as in the uh, burials from Useberg and uh, Gugsta in Norway, which you can see at the Viking Ship Museum near Oslo today. And then in the sagas, we read of incidents where uh, someone is buried in a ship. So, for example, in the saga of Gisli Sorsun, I'll give you uh, my translation of a, a scene from chapter 17. They all went together to Sabol, where the burial mound was being made, and they laid Thorgrimr in the ship. Then they covered him in the mound, in the old way. And when the mound was complete, Gisli went to the river mouth and took up such a big rock it was nearly a hill, and then dropped it into the ship such that nearly every timber cracked and there was a loud creaking noise. And he said, I don't know how to keep a ship from moving if the weather can move this one. Similarly, in the saga of the people of Laxadal, let me give you a translation of an excerpt from chapter 7 that I've done. And on the last day of the feast, Unner was brought to the burial mound that had been made for her, and she was put onto a ship in the mound, and a large amount of money was put into the mound with her. Then all of this was covered up in the mound. Or in the description of Baldur's funeral in the Prosetta. Again, my translation, uh, from my upcoming translation of the Prosetta. But the Aesir took Baldur's body and brought it to the seashore. 
Baldur's ship was named Hringhorni, the biggest of all ships. The gods wanted to set it forth into the ocean and make Baldur's funeral pyre upon it, but they could not move the ship. They summoned the uh, Jotun woman or, or witch Hiroken to move it. Then Baldur's body was put upon the ship, and when his wife Nana, daughter of Nepr, saw that, she burst from her misery and died. She was placed on the ship, and they set it all on fire. Odin placed the gold ring Draupnir, which creates eight equally valuable rings every ninth night into the pyre. Baldur's horse was also led into the flames, with his saddle and all of his tack. So, a strong association with ships, which which also, of course, appears in the description of the uh, funeral of the chieftain that Ibn Fadlan describes. I have a whole separate video about that, which I'll link in a card and in the end screen uh, for you to look at if you want a detailed look at that. But uh, this, this uh, Arabic writer, Ibn Fadlan, uh, Ahmad Ibn Fadlan, wrote in um, uh, about a journey that he undertook in 922 when he met some men that he called Rus, which was a common term in Eastern Europe and uh, the Middle East apparently for uh, the Norse, probably somewhat mixed with the Slavic people too, that uh, they buried a chieftain, or didn't bury him, they cremated a chieftain in a ship, just as Balder is cremated in a ship. And we also see this association with, with water in the notion of the river of hell, which is called Gjol. Uh, in the Prosetta, when Hermother, a son of Odin, goes to hell to retrieve Baldr, who has died and gone to hell. It says, again my translation, It can be told of Hermother that he rode nine nights through deep, dark valleys where he could not see, before he came to the river Gjol and rode over the Gjol bridge, Gjallarbru, which is roofed with shining gold. Mothguther is the name of the woman who guards the bridge. And uh, the name of this river of hell being Gjol is apparently quite old, as we have an established kinning for hell, the ruler of hell, the, the, the female figure hell, which is Man Gjallar, girl of Gjol. A Gjol seems to mean simply yell, but it could also be related to some obscure Gothic and Old High German words for a handful or a crescent shape. It's hard to say what exactly to do with this. Incidentally, it's interesting to note that Heimdallr's horn is called Gjallarhorn. And while that is often interpreted to mean something like yeller horn, like yells and yell out loud, it is possible that could be the horn of Gjol, the horn of the river of hell. And uh, in that connection, I will mention too that Mimir is said to drink from his well with a horn called Gjallar horn, so perhaps his well is the source of this river, although that's never explicitly said. You know, people always want to take these little details, these little hints, and, and create elaborate structures out of them and say, this is definitely connected to this, this is definitely connected to that. But that's all speculation, right? I just want to give you what we do know and not bother with speculating too much. Now, of course, mythical rivers of the dead are not uncommon. In Finnish, we see that there is a, uh, a river of the dead uh, that um, uh, Lemminkainen's mother has to fish his body out of in Runo 15 of the Kalevala. Of course, there's the five rivers of Hades in Greek tradition, uh, Styx, Lethe, Acheron, Phlegathon, and uh, Cassitis, and Charon, the ferryman. And yes, I know this might not be exactly how people pronounce all those Greek rivers today. I, it's, it's one of those things where I know how to pronounce it in Greek. I have a vague idea of how people pronounce it in English today, and I'm trying to do the letter, and I'm probably doing it quote unquote wrong. Uh, it's also said in Voluspa, in stanza 35 of Voluspa in the Codex Regis, that there is a river called Slither. Uh, quoting from my translation of the Poetic Edda, a river falls from the east full of daggers and swords through valleys of poison. It is named Slither. Here we don't see an explicit association with hell, but it is notable that Saxo Grammaticus, writing in the 1200s in Denmark, states that the dead were said to cross a river of swords to reach the afterworld. So is hell, or the underworld more generally, reached by crossing a river? It seems quite probable that that was an old belief. We also see that in the tradition of the Volsung family, that Odin appears as a ferryman to take the body of Sinfjotli, one of the Volsung heroes, across a, uh, a body of water in uh, uh, Frodo de Sinfjotla, which is in the Porgera, and then in the 
part of the Saga of the Volsungs that borrows from that. But in the majority of texts preserved from Old Norse, hell is a place that is underground, uh, not unlike Christian hell, but this is one of the few things that those two realms seem to share in common. Hell uh, may not always have been considered underground or may have been only kind of inconsistently considered underground. There's a curious fact that in For Skirnes, the journey of Skirnes, sometimes called Skirnes Mole in the Poetic Edda, Sansa 27 we read, you will sit forever on an eagle's nest, turned away from the world, looking in at hell. Food will seem as awful to you as the Midgarder serpent, Jormungandr, seems to men. Uh, this is interesting because eagle's nests, of course, are not underground, so how would you be looking in at hell from an eagle's nest? Um, it seems to imply that there may be at least other realms, parts of other realms, uh, from which you can look laterally, horizontally into hell. Um, it's not, perhaps, only reachable by going underground. Now, hell is ruled by a being named Hell. Here is my translation of the passage in the Prose Edda where Snorri talks about her. Odin cast Hell into Nivelheimr and gave her the power in all the nine realms to portion out room and board for all those who were sent to her, and those are the men who die of sickness or old age. There she owns large homes and farms, Bolstadi, I think it's interesting that this word implies homes and farms together. The fences are magnificently high, and the gates are huge. Her hall is named Storm Increaser, El Yudnir. Her plate is Hunger, Hunger. Her knife is Starvation, Sultr. Her slave is Walking Man, Ganglati. And her slave woman is Walking Woman, Ganglot. The threshold of her door is Falling Pit, Fallandaforad. Her deathbed, her bed is deathbed, Kor, and the tapestries hanging above it are glittering misfortune, bleak and the bowl. She is half blue and half flesh-colored, and for this reason she is easy to recognize, and also both sad-looking and cruel-looking. Now there's a lot to piece apart here. Nivelhamer is the original watery end of Ginungagap, the primeval void, from which the rivers flowed that together with the fires from Muspelsheimer created the first living being, Ymir. So, Hel may be part of Nivelheimer. It is interesting that she is said to portion out room and board, that there's a mention of, uh, like, like I said, this word that, that implies both homes and farms. She does have a plate, she has a knife, um, so there is there's consumption in Hel, right? This is not a place where your bodily needs have ended. You have died, but you still have substantially the same needs, this implies as we also have implied by the fact that Baldr is welcomed with a feast, which includes, uh, which, which includes great drink when he comes to hell. It is also interesting to note that this description of her half blue and half flesh colored is restricted to Snorri, but this has become part of the, uh, what I will call the modern canon of Norse mythology in the form of her being portrayed as being half living and half dead, uh, divided uh, down her nose. It's not entirely clear that's actually what he means here. Um, and the, the blue part does probably imply that she looks like a corpse since blue is often what uh, a, a rotten, um, rotten corpses are said to be, uh, especially the undead. So the Afterganga or zombie-like creature of Norse myth is, is usually said to be blue. In fact, they're usually said, often said to be blor sem hell, uh, blue as hell. Uh, as in uh, the, the Afterganga Glomer in Gretis Saga, chapter 32. Han var dauder och blar som hell en digger som naut. He was dead and blue as hell, but thick as a steer. Or the uh, Afterganga Thorover in Örbygge Saga, chapter, 30, uh, chapter 63. Var han tho en ofuin och en tros legastiatio. Han var blar som hell och digger som naut. He was still unrodden then, and very trollish to see. He was blue as hell, and thick as a steer. Now, I think that it is probable that in the course of Norse belief over time, hell went from the afterlife for everyone to an afterlife for some. If you read something like uh, the Iliad or parts of the Old Testament, it also appears that there's essentially one afterlife and that it's a, a shadow of our world rather than a very different place. Uh, and it's interesting to note, too, 
that there's a real physicality to the way that the afterlife is discussed in, in Old Norse. Um, there's, there's eating there, there's drinking there, um, there's, there's farms there apparently, and also no one says in any of these texts so-and-so's soul went to blank afterlife. No one's soul goes to Valhall, no one's soul goes to hell. It's always just plain and simple, he went to hell, he went to Valhall. Uh, so it's not always clear that there's even the same notion of the separation of the soul and the body that um, many modern Christians uh, believe in today. It's also interesting that Valhall probably isn't all that old of an idea. If we look at the poem Atlakvida from the Poetic Edda, probably the oldest poem in the Poetic Edda, probably composed in the 800s based on very solid linguistic evidence, we see in stanza two, Druku thar drot megir and diljender thogdu vin i Valhollu. The lords of men drank wine there in Valhol, and the deniers were silent. Well, people had haters back then too. But note that these are living men who were just drinking in their hall, and that appears to be Valhol. Now to me and many others that have suggested that uh, Valhol at this time did not mean an afterlife. Uh, Val is uh, a word for those dead on the battlefield, the quote-unquote slain, and hall means hall. So of course it could also be something that someone would simply call their hall of warriors in a sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek way, right? Those of us who are about to die, the hall for those of us. Although it could also be a tongue-in-cheek reference to the afterlife. I don't deny that's possible. But we also see the possibility that Valhol is sort of part of hell. It seems like hell really does mean basically the grave. Once you're in the grave, remember that the body and the soul don't seem to be separated here. Once you're in the grave, you're in hell, whatever other afterlife you might be in. Consider this scene from Gisli's Saga, chapter 14, which has puzzled many people in uh, my unpublished translation. Now Gisli prepared to bury Vestain in a mound in the sandbank that is opposite Sev Pond, below Sabol. And when Gisli had reached this place, Thorgrimer arrived with many men for the burial. And when they had given Vestain the proper clothes according to the beliefs of the time, Thorgrimer went to Gisli and said, it is a custom to tie hell shoes on men who have to walk to Valhol, and I'll do this for Vestain. And when he had done it, he said, I sure don't know how to tie a pair of hell shoes if these ever come loose. Now, what are hell shoes? Except shoes for hell, but they're being tied on the feet of a man who is going to Valhol. It is a custom to tie hell shoes on men who have to walk to Valhol. That, to me, implies, again, that hell is not even if the idea of Valhol is actually older than Atlakvida, and it is a separate afterlife for those who die in battle, that at the same time, the word hell means afterlife above and beyond what particular category of afterlife you may be in. We also see something similar in the poem uh, Hervarakvida in the saga of Hervor and Heidrek, which is appearing soon in a translation by me together with the saga of Rolf Kraki. In this poem, often called The Waking of Angantyr, which uh, I have rendered in uh, my complete English translation in another video that, again, I'll link in a card, we see Hervor speaking to the Afterganga, zombie-like figure of her father. She says, and so he has died in battle. She's standing at the threshold of his grave and talking to him. She said, you don't speak true. May a god leave you to sit whole in your grave if you don't have Tyrving, a sword she wants from him, with you. You are reluctant to deliver the inheritance to your only child. Then the grave mound opened, and it was as though fire and flame were all over the grave. Then Angantyr said, Hell's gate draws up, the grave mounds open. Everything is in flame on the island around. It's an evil sight to look out of the grave. Hurry back, young lady. Go back to your ships. So here... He has died in battle, by implication he would go to Valhol, but she opens up his grave and finds him there, inhabiting his corpse still, and he says Hell's gate draws up when she opens the grave. Is, in fact, the gate to Hell simply the opening of the grave, right? Is the grave itself Hell? 
I think that's quite a likely explanation uh, for at least part of the way that the word hell is used in Old Norse. Consider also the poem Helga Kvitha Hundingspana II, the second poem of Helgi, Killer of Hunding, which is in the Poetic Edda. I'll read here from the end of that poem in my translation of the Poetic Edda, which is available in paperback and hardcover from Hackett, and as an audiobook from Blackstone. A burial mound was made for Helgi, and when he came to Valhalla, Odin asked him to help him rule everything. Helgi said, Hunding, you will be a foot washer and fire starter, a dog walker and a horse's groom for every man in Valhalla, and don't forget to feed the pigs before you go to sleep. Uh, Hunding is his enemy who he's ordering around here. One of Sigrun's, uh, Sigrun is Helgi's wife, one of Sigrun's serving women walked during the evening near Helgi's burial mound, and she saw Helgi riding toward the mound with a large following of men. The serving woman said, Is this an illusion that I see before me, or has Ragnarok come? I see dead men riding, I see them driving their horses with spurs. Have dead kings been given leave to come home from Valhalla? Helgi said, True, you see us here, driving our horses with spurs. And it is no illusion, nor is it Ragnarok, and neither do we have leave to come home from Valhalla. The serving woman went home and said to Sigrun, Go out from your home, Sigrun, if you want to see your king again. His burial mound is open. Helgi has come back. His wounds are bleeding. That lord of men asks that you come and see to his injuries. Sigrun went inside Helgi's burial mound and she said, Now I am as happy to see you, husband, as Odin's eager ravens are when they see fresh, warm corpses, or when, dew-covered, they greet the morning. I want to kiss you, my living king, before you take your bloody armor off. There's frost frozen in your hair, Helgi. There's blood all over your body, my king. Your hands are wet with the cold blood of Hokni's kin. My lord, how shall I heal you of these things? Then Helgi uh, criticizes her a little bit for having caused all of this. Uh, and uh, we come back to him here in Sansa 46. But I can drink happily of Odin's good mead, even if I have lost my lands and my love. No one will sing a sorrowful song for me, even if I have wounds on my chest. For my wife Sigrun is in my mound. The Valkyrie lies by me, though I am dead. Sigrun climbed into his bed in the mound. Sigrun said, Helgi of Ilving Kin, I offer you untroubled rest in this place. I want to sleep in your embrace as I would in the arms of a living husband. Helgi said, Now I can foresee everything. You will sleep, lovely lady, daughter of Hogni, tonight and tomorrow morning in the arms of a dead man in his mound. And yet you are alive, noble lady. Yet still, I must ride the warpath, take my pale horse back to Valhalla. I have to be west of Bivrost before the rooster wakes the men in Odin's hall. Helgi and his men rode their way, and Sigrun and her serving women returned to her home. The next evening, Sigrun had a serving woman keep watch on Helgi's burial mound. And when Sigrun returned to the mound at sunset, she said, My husband, the son of Sigmund, would have come back from Odin's hall if he could. But I expect there is little chance of his return when eagles sleep in the trees and all the people are dreaming. A serving woman said, do not be so foolish that you go alone to his burial mound. All the dead are more powerful at night than they are during bright day. Now, keeping in mind that all of these different poems come from different times and places and reflect probably different shades of belief, this is a really interesting, complex picture. He goes to Valholm, and again, it is him, and it seems like it's his entire body because he gets wounded there. He eats and drinks there, and he can come back and be in his mound with his wife and lie with her as if they're both still alive. And at the end, the serving woman warns Sigrun that she should not go back there, not because he's not in that burial mound, but because he is somehow dangerous to her. And uh, that this, that, but, but then at the same time, it sort of contradicts him saying that he's there without leave from Valhul. But he's moving back and forth between Valhul and his burial mound, right? There's not one single easy place that the, the dead... Helgi is forever. Uh, this is a much more complex picture. And in the next video, which I'm going to do as a sequel rather than as the rest of this one, because I think that these concepts really do deserve 
um, somewhat separate treatment, and, and the ideas in this one deserve some digestion. Uh, I'm going to go over Valhol. My videos are supported by my generous Patreon supporters, many of whom are thanked at the end of this video. I've also translated the Poetic Edda and the Saga of the Volsungs from Old Norse into English. Those are also available as audiobooks. For now, as always, from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best.